So today we're happy to have uh, Roland Bauerschmidt from Cambridge. And um, Roland will tell us about uh, the log Sobolev inequality for the sine Gordon model. OK. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be speaking in the seminar, even though it would be much more of a pleasure to be there. Yeah, and un unmute yourself. OK, sorry about this. So let me restart. Um, so let me uh, say that it's a great pleasure to be speaking in the seminar, um, even though it would be an even much greater pleasure to be uh, speaking in person. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not possible. Um, so um, I'll be explaining, I'll, I'll try to explain a few things um, uh, related to, uh, to the sine Gordon model, which I will introduce. and. In particular, uh, in this first talk, uh, I'll be uh, discussing um, dynamics and uh, an approach to um, obtaining uh, the Luxobolev inequality for this and um, uh, and possibly related models. Um, so this will be relatively general, but uh, but then towards the end of the talk, I'll, I'll um, uh, become more specific and discuss in particular the sine Gordon field. And there's a second talk by uh, Michael Hofstetter, uh, who will discuss uh, further as aspects, in particular, um, uh, the uh, question of the extremal uh, behavior of, of, of this field. Uh, but OK, let me uh, start um, uh, the, with uh, more specifically with the setting. So I'm always interested in probability measures on, let's say, a finite uh, uh, state space. Um, uh, R to the lambda. And uh, so most generally, uh, we, I write this, uh, these measures in the form e to the minus h uh, of phi, and phi is uh, my random field in R to the lambda. Uh, and uh, lambda will always be a, you should always think of lambda as a subset of, uh, say, Zd. Um, um, though for um, for, for, for many things, it will, not, it will not really matter what lambda is, but this is what I'd like to have in mind. So lambda is a subset of Zd. And uh, I will uh, call this uh, the lattice problem. So um, we have one random variable for every lattice site. Um, um, I'll also discuss what I call the continuum problem. Um, the continuum problem is the same as the lattice problem. Um, so um, in, the, in the sense that uh, what I call the continuum problem is the lattice problem on a lattice of mesh size epsilon. Uh, of course, the mesh size doesn't really matter. You can sc scale the lattice however you want. So the continuum problem in my uh, language is the same as the lattice problem. But the uh, scaling and the questions um, will have a mind uh, different ones. And so it's, uh, it's good and, uh, to think about this as a different uh, uh, of a different setting, and then you'll see a little bit in, uh, coming soon. So we'll be discussing the lattice problem, the continuum problem. And in either case, um, uh, I'm interested in problems of statistical uh, physics. So uh, the number of points is supposed to go to infinity. And uh, in the lattice problem, that happens if you take, say, the a box or the subset of the ZD uh, becoming infinite. Uh, in the, Continuum problem, it, can al it already happens if you take, say, a fixed size domain, but then take the uh, mesh size to zero. But you could also take both limits there. OK, so this is uh, very general. Uh, more specifically, the measures we're interested in have, have this form. H of i is basically consists of two, two terms. The first term is um, um, a quadratic term. Um, could be more general, but for, for us, it will always be quadratic. And it's uh, basically, uh, um, uh, it's the uh, Dirichlet energy of this uh, field phi, if, if you like. Um, so it, um, it, um, it is large if the spin configurations uh, are rough, and it's uh, small if they are flat. Um, and then we, we, um, we'd like to add a, um, a potential term. The potential term is um, is local, so it's, a, it's it's some function uh, which I will call v, uh, summed over all sites, um, and so this is what I will call a local potential. 
And uh, well, the cases I'm interested in, this function V is, is not quadratic and it's also not convex. Um, and so the question is how uh, to understand the interaction of these two terms, which are sort of have different structure, uh, right? One is a quadratic and uh, like spins two lines. The other one is local, but it's, uh, it's not convex. Um, but it's still good um, here um, to have in mind uh, what can happen. So the simplest case is where this potential is, is, is not there, um, this uh, so-called Gaussian free field. Um, uh, so this uh, uh, potential H is just the Dirichlet energy. And uh, in this case, uh, this is the Gaussian model. You can compute the covariance, which is the Green's function. and uh, correlations um, behave logarithmically in two dimensions and they polynomially uh, in higher dimensions. And a lot of things can be said about uh, this model because of this uh, Gaussian structure, particular has a scale invariance uh, property. Um, if you uh, pass to the epsilon to zero limit, um, large scales and small scales are basically the same by, by scaling. Uh, this is not true in models that have a, a, a non-quadratic uh, interaction, right? So if we add a, um, um, an interaction term, um, uh, these models will in general not be scale invariant and there is a difference of uh, large scale and small scale questions. So two um, model, so, so two proof, Two prototypical models um, are the, what, say, uh, the, dub, the double well model and the periodic potential model, uh, also called Phi 4 model or the Sine Gordon model. So, in the, in the double well model, you, you have a potential V that is a, that is a double well. And um, um, so, the standard choice for such a double well. Uh, if you're on a lattice, is, uh, is this phi four potential? It's uh, some cons positive constants times pi to the four uh, minus some positive constant phi squared, so or plus a negative constant times phi squared. Um, the periodic potential similarly is uh, well, it's a periodic function. The simplest periodic function is the cosine. So so here the potential is, is just cosine. Um, um, with a certain uh, period, uh, which um, which uh, we'll see, or which has an effect on the behavior of these models, um, and then there's various constants that uh, determine the strength of these potentials, and so on. Okay, so so these are the um, the um, so the the standard choices for for these uh, potentials. If you are if you are in the continuum, well. Um, uh, at this point, I have to explain a little bit what, what we mean when, when I say we want to be in the continuum, epsilon to zero. Of course, we can take the lattice model and rescale it uh, and let epsilon go to zero. And, and that's an interesting thing to do. But what's typically understood on in the continuum model is a, um, is, is a scaling of, of the parameters of the model. So in this case, it's the for the phi four model, you have to uh, uh, you have to uh, scale with epsilon the parameter in, in terms of the phi squared term. In terms of the periodic model, you have to uh, tune uh, the strength of the nonlinearity with epsilon in such a way that as epsilon tends to zero, um, you construct a non-Gaussian measure, say, and, and so these are typically. Um, uh, random Schwartz distributions. Um, so for the free field, if you pass to the limit epsilon to zero, you obtain a, a field that's a, a distribution value, Schwartz distribution valued. And uh, in these continuum models, um, you can do the same and you obtain non-Gaussian distributions um, that are on Schwartz distributions. Okay, so, so these are the two um, um, settings that um, there are many other settings that would be interesting, but these are sort of the two, two main uh, settings in this class of models that I'd uh, like to have in mind. But mostly I'll be talking about uh, the continuum setting, in particular about this uh, sine Gordon model today. Um, okay, 
So we'll get there, but so I, I, this is uh, what I like. Um, so these are the type of models I, I'd like you to keep in mind. And um, most of what I say uh, should apply to these models, but I will really only uh, discuss what happens in, the, in this case. Um, does this uh, does everything make, make sense uh, up to this point? So please uh, uh, do interrupt me at any point. Uh, if something is unclear, I, I'm happy to expand on any um, definitions or motivation at any point. Okay. All right. So, so there's uh, many questions you could ask. So the sort of the basic classical ones are uh, what is the behavior at large scales and small scales? So at large scales, um, you may ask uh, for about the decay of correlations, uh, phase transitions, etc. So these are very interesting questions. Um, at small scales, um, on the other hand, so the first question you might ask is, well, does this limit epsilon to zero exist? Uh, so that's uh, sort of the existence question. Then you can ask about um, well, as I mentioned, these limits are typically Schwartz distributions. You can ask various regularity properties um, that they might have or might not have and so on. So, so they're basically the existence and regularity questions that are the first questions for the small scale behavior. Now, in, in, as I mentioned in the uh, Gaussian model, these two questions are sort of uh, basic or often, or in, no, okay, it doesn't really have to do with Gaussian, but in scale invariant models, these, um, questions are related, but in general, they are not. And um, so, okay, so let me emphasize, there's been a lot of work over many centuries uh, on uh, particular, getting a good understanding of a lot of uh, these questions in particular. They're they are quite well understood for the models I presented on the previous slide. Well, okay, let me, uh, they are reasonably well understood. Not, there, there are still a lot of things that are not, uh, okay, anyway. But um, my focus is on aspects of these models, which I think are also interesting, but uh, uh, much uh, less studied and understood um, because uh, they are um, more global uh, questions about these, um, 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 about these models that, um, um, that are for that reason harder to access. So one of the, the, these is the question of dynamics. So um, um, you can consider various types of dynamics um, that uh, are related to these measures. Um, so my focus will in particular be on stochastic dynamics. So think uh, Glauber dynamics, so um, uh, random uh, evolution with uh, driven by, by some noise. Um, and um, so the basic questions you could ask uh, are the same ones as in the static case um, for the dynamics. So wh how does the dynamics behave at short scales and at large scales? How fast does it converge to equilibrium and things like that? Um, there are also very interesting questions, which I will not say anything about, but just let me just mention is that you can also consider uh, deterministic dynamics in the continuum that are related to, uh, to these uh, the measures in the continuum, like random Schrodinger evolution and so on, um, nonlinear Schrodinger evolution and so on. But anyway, so there's a, a lot of uh, questions that are much uh, less understood than the, the sort of the, um, uh, the classical questions. Uh, you can also uh, ask for, um, so uh, you can also ask about the extremal behavior of this field. So in some sense, um, um, this is a question that um, um, compared to uh, what I explained in the, the first two uh, points, decay of correlation, existence, and so on, uh, is a much more nonlinear problem. Uh, and uh, there has been a lot of progress on, on this type of um, uh, question and, and various models. And in our context, uh, uh, Michael in the second talk will, uh, will discuss um, this problem. Um, and then, uh, okay, there are also, um, um, uh, okay, so this is not something I will discuss here, but at this point I could uh, advertise a, a little bit. There's another talk um, in the IAMP uh, Mathematical Physics Seminar where we'll discuss some integrability results, which is um, 
the solvability of, of certain uh, aspects, but okay, let me not go into the CRI. This is a different story. Um, okay, so these are the kind of questions um, I have in mind. And um, um, the problem I want to focus on in this first part of the talk, uh, this first talk is, is the uh, dynamics, and uh, I will think of the dynamic, or I will look at the dynamics in, in, in terms of its, uh, the Lok Sobolev constant, uh, or the relaxation uh, speed of the, um, uh, of the dynamics to equilibrium. So, okay, so let me uh, um, explain the context. So again, as before, we have a measure nu, um, uh, which is of this form e to the minus h. Um, um, and as I explained uh, uh, in our setting, this H really has some structure. And uh, so the structure is that it consists of two parts. One part is uh, this uh, um, um, part which uh, corresponds to something like a Laplacian and the other part is, is, uh, is the potential part. And this is something that we really want to use. The corresponding um, um, canonical uh, stochastic dynamics, um, call it Glauber dynamics or Langevin dynamics or whatever you like, uh, is this uh, SDE. Um, and um, so if, if, you, if you are in the context of, of the models I discussed before in the continuum, this would become an SPDE if you take epsilon to zero. This is the type of SPDE, singular SPDE that, uh, that have been studied a lot in, in, in recent years, but um, uh, I will not, I will try to, um, I was, everything I will say is, is epsilon positive, but uniform in epsilon, so um, we don't have to discuss these technicalities here. Okay, so, and then um, we'd, we'd like to understand um, um, how fast um, does this, or, or basic question to understand is how fast uh, does this dynamics um, equilibrate? And a good way to measure this is in terms of the Lok Sobolev constant. Um, so we're interested in how fast uh, the relative entropy uh, of uh, the distribution at, uh, at time t relaxes com compared to the initial distribution. And the rate of this relaxation, uh, gamma, is, um, is what is uh, called the Lok Sobolev constant. Uh, so this is a particularly useful way to measure uh, the um, uh, trend to equilibrium because uh, the Lok Sobolev constant is uh, characterized in a variational way, as the um, as the um, as the term Lok Sobolev inequality already um, uh, implies. Um, namely, um, uh, gamma is equivalently the best constant in, in this inequality, which is already yellow. Um, so I can't make it yellow again, but um, it's uh, the best constant in this Lok Sobolev inequality, um, which is um, uh, measuring uh, the relative entropy uh, of, uh, of a function f, or which you sh should think of. Um, okay, maybe let me at this point slow down a little bit and um, go back to, um, as it's going to become somewhat important, um, uh, say a bit uh, more what the relative entropy is. So, so we have a probability measure new, and we want to measure the relative entropy of another probability measure with respect to this measure new. Um, um, so this relative entropy is, uh, is defined as uh, F log F, if F is the density of, of, uh, of the measure mu with respect to which we want to, with respect to new, uh, Okay, so in other words, the relative entropy of F nu with respect to nu is uh, expectation with respect to nu F log F. Okay, I, I'm sorry if this, uh, if you, uh, I'm sure m many people in this audience will, will have seen this before. If you haven't, my explanation was, uh, it's not gonna have um, 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 make you very, uh, has, hasn't been convincing, but anyway, so the relative entropy is a good notion to measure the distance of, of this measure mu with respect to some other measure. And uh, so, okay, so, so we have the characterization of, of this uh, relaxation rate in terms of this Lok Sobolev constant. And the basic question I want to emphasize, uh, I want to focus on is how do we get 
good accurate estimates on, on the log Sobolev constant for measures uh, of the type that I introduced. So they, um, they have this, um, they, they have a density e to the minus h. And um, okay, so there's one case which is uh, rather well understood, which is when this function h is, is convex. Um, equivalently, uh, we could ask that uh, V is convex and that H is a, is a positive definite matrix. Um, in this case, um, there's the celebrated uh, bakri emery uh, result, which um, tells us that uh, if we phrase it in terms of A and V, um, if A is bounded below as a quadratic form by some constant lambda times the identity and V is convex, uh, then the log Sobolev constant uh, gamma is at least uh, as big as uh, lambda. Now, this is a very beautiful uh, result and it's also extremely uh, useful because it's very general and the conditions are easy to check. Um, the downside in our context is that the potentials we're interested in are, are usually not convex. And um, as soon as you take a non-convex potential, um, uh, all sorts of things can happen. I mean, you cannot expect a result uh, of the same uh, generality because we do know that these models uh, have phase transitions. The behavior chain can change drastically if you vary one parameter a, a tiny bit. If you are above the phase transition, uh, you can have a, a, bound, a log Sobolev constant bounded, say in the system size and the number of points. If you vary it slightly, if you're below the phase transition, it's going to diverge exponentially. And, things like that. So um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong if you get out of the uh, class of convex uh, potentials. And you cannot hope to have a, a uh, characterization as simple. It's just not going to happen. Uh, Roland, uh, I have a question. Um, uh, yes. Hi, but, Ron. Hi, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, I, uh, in fact, also it's not true for the matrices or operators A that you have that they're greater than lambda times the identity because they're the La Laplacian, right? Okay, that's a very good point. Um, uh, indeed. So um, there's a point I swept under the rug. Um, so if we're looking at finite volume, uh, we'd like to uh, say um, uh, you always have to impose some kind of boundary condition. Uh, let's say uh, if we, okay, so this is a good example. Let's look at the case of the Gaussian free field. So V is equal to zero. Uh, A is the Laplacian. Of course, if you look at uh, the log Sopolev constant, so, okay, so uh, in that case, A is the Laplacian, so it has a zero, zero mode. Uh, there's no uh, probability measure you can define uh, with this uh, quadratic form A in finite volume at least. So you need to impose boundary conditions or in some other way uh, make the spectrum uh, go away from zero, right? Um, the standard way would be to impose boundary conditions and that will give you a small gap uh, lambda. And in fact, in the Gaussian case, that is the truth for the uh, log Sobolev constant, right? So say if you look at a box of site length uh, uh, L, um, the smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian with Dirichlet boundary condition is L to the minus two. And that is the gap of the um, of of this uh, uh, dynamics. I, I see. Very good. Thanks. <laughs> so I mean, in the Gaussian case, uh, this is uh, even though we're looking at a Laplacian which doesn't have a gap, but what's the at boundary condition? This is uh, sharp, if you want. Um, Thanks. Uh, okay. Very good. Um, yes. Please do interrupt me um, um, uh, with questions like this. Um, this was a very good one. Okay. So. Um, so it's a, as I mentioned, it's a beautiful result and the proof is even more beautiful or just as beautiful, um, but um, it does not use the structure of A. It uses that A has a gap, say, that we impose through boundary conditions as in the case that I just explained, but it doesn't use that A and often times has, has an intricate structure. Say A is the Laplacian. 
that is a it's a, it's it's a way different operator from um, the generic operator that has a gap lambda, right? A generic operator with gap lambda, you could just take a projection operator with a constant lambda or something like that. Uh, a is a Laplacian. Uh, if you say expanded an eigenfunction, it has uh, coefficients on uh, you know corresponding to all Fourier modes, or as I would say, to all scales um, in a non-trivial way. So. So as beautiful as this result is, it doesn't use the structure of A. And uh, sort of, um, of course, that makes it um, as general as it is, but it also limits its applicability in our context of interest. OK. Um, so I will try to explain how to uh, get a similar condition that uh, can effectively use uh, the structure of A. And by doing so, um, apply to some of the cases uh, uh, I explained before. So, okay, so this slide is uh, um, going to be a little bit uh, more, um, um, okay, it'll have a little bit more content than the previous ones in the sense that I'm, uh, what's going to be a little bit uh, denser. So, but again, let me start emphasizing that the probability measure we're discussing is, is this measure are new and it uh, has these two parts uh, e to the minus uh, one half phi a phi which again a you should think of a laplacian possibly with boundary conditions and uh, v is this local potential um, now as i already uh, ex so if we drop the v go back to the free field case well, then we have a Gaussian measure with covariance A inverse. I guess I should use blue for this. So we have a Gaussian measure with covariance A inverse. Now this covariance A inverse is the Green's function of, of our Laplace operator A. So we can write it as an integral over the corresponding heap kernel e to the minus S A. So e to the minus S A is the um, heat kernel, if we think of A as a Laplace operator. So in particular, uh, we, we, we see this covariance, you know, it's, uh, has contributions from, from all scales. If we think of the heat kernel uh, with uh, time S as, you know, being supported uh, on scale S. So what exactly do I mean? Well, remember, say, if we're in D dimensions, the heat kernel is, is a Gaussian kernel uh, whose covariance is, uh, um, uh, well, it's a, it's a Gaussian function um, uh, of the distance between the two points, and uh, the variance is, uh, is S. So in some sense, the two points will be, uh, maybe I should, um, oh, this was the wrong. So a heat kernel would be, um, I would just said in words, uh, would be something like this, right? Maybe. And um, um, uh, so um, it effect it's effectively supported on distances which are at most square root s. So the so we're we're summing up or integrating up uh, contributions here that, um, that are correlated on this scale S. And this correlation scale is, is what I will uh, uh, call, or this is what I would call a scale. Um, okay. And the free field is given by sort of summing up all scales. Um, so here I've discussed it in terms of covariance, but of course you could also write this as a stochastic integral or something like that and realize uh, the free field uh, in terms of, as contributions corresponding to these scales. Um, okay, so the, um, uh, what this, what, uh, what I would like to do is, um, rather than looking at all scales at once, uh, look at the scales um, from, let's say, 0 to s. So I'm defining a new covariance 
CS, which um, unlike A inverse, is not the integral over all scales from zero to infinity, but it's, integ it's the integral from zero to S of this heat kernel. So this CS is a heat kernel integrated from zero to S. Um, and it will be, so it will be correlated on, on scale S again, because you know, uh, all scales U less than S are correlated on smaller scales than S. And so this defines uh, again a Gaussian measure uh, by because we're specifying the covariance matrix, we get a Gaussian measure. Uh, you note the expectation of this Gaussian measure by E C S. So that's this, uh, so if S is infinity, this is the expectation of the free field. Um, but it allows us in a continuous way to um, you know vary the scales of the free field. Um, okay, so this. Um, so, and for the free field, of course, there's many ways you could um, uh, divide uh, up into scales, right? So this is, so I, I took, given you one way to, you know, reveal the scales of the free field, but uh, you, you could look at other ways. You could look at the Fourier decomposition. You could look at, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, flexibility you have uh, because of its, uh, its beautiful, its nice structure, it's Gaussian and you, you change coordinates however you want and so there there's a, there's a lot of nice structure that allows you to um, 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 understand how the free field uh, has many scales uh, um, and, and, and use this in an effective way now once we add a potential uh, it becomes much more delicate because say if we decompose the free field in Fourier modes. This is a, it's a very useful uh, decomposition of the free field, but it interacts very badly with a potential V that is nonlinear, right? If you have a Fourier decomposition, you have a nice decomposition for the free field, but if you add a, a nonlinear potential, it's gonna be highly uh, non-local in uh, Fourier space. Um, so it's, um, um, so the part of the difficulty is how to understand, how to you know, uh, look at the scales that the free field uh, imposes together with the nonlinearity that, uh, or uh, the effect on the nonlinearity um, without breaking the structure completely. So, um, so okay, so. And here is one way you can do that. Um, or here's one way that, that has proved um, uh, a very uh, effective way for us to do this, um, which is um, um, we define, uh, so we, we have this decomposed uh, free field now, and uh, we can correspondingly define uh, what is uh, called the renormalized potential. So again, this varies continuously with the scale parameter S and I'm defining this uh, put renormalized potential uh, Vs uh, as uh, in terms of um, the convolution of the Gaussian um, measure with this covariant Cs with respect to E to the minus uh, the initial potential. Um, so this is, so this is our, so this formula defines e to the minus vs. So taking the logarithm, uh, we get vs as minus log of, of this convolution. So this is the definition of the renormalized potential associated to this way of decomposing the free field. And uh, it turns out that this renormalized potential has a lot of uh, nice uh, structure. So for example, um, you can write down a uh, differential equation or PDE that uh, this uh, renormalized potential satisfies as a function of the scale. Um, uh, Roland, uh, yeah. just clarifying the definition of Vs is V0 the same as V? Oh, yes, very good. It is. Uh, so uh, V0 is the same as V. Oops. Uh, yes, so maybe let me not write it down, but V0 is the same as V. Thank you. 
And um, so, okay, maybe I should go back one slide. Uh, so V0 is the same as V. And um, so since our definition of E to the minus Vs is a Gaussian convolution, um, it'll satisfy a linear uh, equation, basically a heat equation with a symbol that's varying uh, with this as this covariant Cs. Once you take the logarithm of this, you, you get a nonlinear equation, right, which is this one for the effective potential. So this is an equation that um, is uh, in some form, uh, well, in variation, at least uh, very well known in, in physics. And it uh, goes under the name of uh, Polchinski equation there. Uh, mathematically, uh, you perhaps like to think of it as a as a type of Hamilton-Jacobi equation with a with a uh, with a diffusion term. Uh, so uh, we have uh, so the potential changes. So there is a Laplacian term, so a diffusion term, and then there is a, a minus a gradient v squared term, so Hamilton-Jacobi-like term. But it's uh, but there's there's a couple of points I want to emphasize. Um, so um, first of all. Um, okay, let me emphasize the following points. Um, uh, first of all, what is uh, this is an equation in extremely high dimensions, right? So remember, we're looking at an equation for v. V is the potential. It's uh, so v is a function on r to the lambda, right? So so v is a function from r to the lambda to to let's say r. So it's uh, we're looking at an equation for a, 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 a um, for a function in extremely high dimension, lambda is going to infinity, and sort of the main issue is getting estimates on this uh, function that are uniform in lambda. So it's not the typical uh, uh, PDE question here, maybe uh, in the sense that it's a very high dimensional one. Uh, second, um, what is essential really here, uh, and this is maybe what distinguishes it from, you know, if you talk about Hamilton-Jacobi equations in general, is that the symbol of, of the operators is varying in time. So time is our scale, right? And the symbols are varying in time. So we look at the Laplacian term, for example, uh, this one first one. Um, what is it? So we're taking the second derivative of, uh, of our potential. Uh, and uh, remember, so we have to take in the direction phi x and uh, phi y. So those are our variables, right? Phi x, x is in lambda. So these are finitely many variables. And we're taking this uh, second derivative in, in, in r to the lambda. And then there's the symbol here that in the Laplacian that uh, does depend, first of all, it does depend on scale. Uh, and it depends on these two uh, uh, points x, y. And in fact, the symbol is the heat kernel. So, right, so this uh, c dot is uh, the derivative with respect to s of this uh, cs. So that is just the heat kernel, e to the minus s a x, y. So if you think of this as a function of x and y, this is a heat kernel. It has a it has a it has significant spatial structure here, and it's dependent on this uh, time s. Um, and so that's really the uh, the essential point. And uh, I, I guess uh, Polchinski, a, a famous uh, physicist, what, what he proposed that we have, I mean, this uh, scale. Uh, dependent uh, way of uh, evolving the potential. And the same, and, and it's the situation is completely analogous for, for, the, for the quadratic term in this Hamilton Jacobi term equation, where again the symbol is, is this heat kernel. Okay, so I have introduced this uh, somewhat intimidating equation. Um, um, at least I 
think it's a somewhat intimidating equation if you see it for the first time. It's a nonlinear PDE in many, many dimensions. And in fact, it is an intimidating equation, but uh, it turns out, um, okay, we'll get there. Um, let me mention, and this will become important only later on, is that, um, so I've told you how to, you know, change the measure, the free field measure, the Gaussian part into a scale dependent part one, that's this one. And I've also told you how to change the um, potential into a scale dependent one, which is um, this one, right? So the, um, the renormalized potential. You can also put these back together to, to get a complete measure that is a scale dependent interpolation of our original measure nu. Uh, this is what I will call the renormalized measure. And it will play an important role later. Um, where, so this, it depends on S here, and it's given by taking, instead of the original potential V naught, you take the renormalized potential. And it's, instead of taking the full Gaussian free field, which is the uh, one, the Gaussian measure was covariant C infinity, you take uh, C infinity minus uh, the covariant CS. So in other words, minus the scales you've already convolved into Vs. Um, um, this is a Gaussian measure now that is uh, supported on, uh, it's, uh, okay, we, we, it's, it's a non-Gaussian, okay, anyway, we'll get back to this, but this it turns out is, um, is a very good way of uh, changing how this measure new evolves in scale. And um, okay, we, we get there, but okay, so, um, right, so uh, let me pause for a second and um, we've explained, I've, I've introduced this renormalized potential uh, and I want to uh, give you the following exercise, maybe not to be solved uh, right now, but uh, later on, um, or maybe I'll give you the solution anyway, um, uh, just to, uh, to uh, exemplify what's happening here is if we start with a potential that is convex, then in fact, under this equation, the renormalized convention potential remains convex for all S. Um, so we start with a convex potential, we have a renormalized potential that's convex. On the other hand, if you start with a non-convex potential, it could, become, it could become convex at some point or it doesn't. Um, um, but uh, in the convex case, we always remain in the convex case. Um, Roland, yes. uh, can I ask you uh, in, in the previous slide, so just to be sure that I fully understand, in the definition of the renormalized potential, you have this zeta. Zeta is sampled from the Gaussian measure. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. So, and uh, then uh, just to understand this Gaussian measure, you wrote CS as an integral. Uh, a, I understand it to be the heat kernel, or e to the minus uh, u a is the heat kernel at scale uh, u. But then the, is this integral, should I think of it probabilistically? I mean, is it that you... No, not, not right now. Um, uh, no, uh, at this point, I mean, there is a probabilistic way to think about this. And maybe I'll mention this very briefly at the end. And I think it will also feature again in uh, Michael's second talk. Um, but uh, at this point, I'm not thinking of this integral as probabilistically. I'm just thinking of basically uh, have, taking this singular covariance, which is the heat kernel, and um, you know, revealing it scale by scale. Isn't isn't it a truncated Green function? Uh, I suppose it is. Uh, I mean, it is right. Yes. You look at the yeah. Green function up to s. Exactly, instead of yes, up to that, infinity. Exactly, that's what it is. So, I mean, you yeah. can do that, but it's it's not sort of at the heart of what I'm... Sure. Yeah, indeed, yes. Um, on, on an intuitive level, basically what you're doing is you're saying, I have this function phi. I could look at the actual potential on phi, but I'm kind of like ignoring the local oscillations on phi by convoluting it with this... Uh, exactly. everything up to scale s, and then I look what the expected 
uh, potential is, right? This is like the way- Yeah, that, that, that was a perfect summary. That was much better than I uh, said it. <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. So the VS, roughly speaking, it forgets about all the local fluctuations. And that's what this is a renormalized measure. So we try, I mean, the goal is to forget about the local, the small scale fluctuations, if you want, the fluctuation from scale zero to S. Um, but, but Roland, just a silly question. Uh, the way it's written as an integral, uh, this measure CS, I mean, this uh, covariance, I don't know, it, um, it doesn't uh, integrate to one. So, uh, I mean, because you didn't normalize the integral. No, in any... no, it integrates to the heat kernel. Uh, to, uh, to the full greens function. What, what I meant to say is that, um, um, okay, well, oh, all right, maybe, maybe it's okay. Um, right, this is a covariance, so, right. Yeah, it's a covariance. Right, so, okay. I mean, if right. you want to think about probabilistically, you mm -hmm. could think, uh, you could take, uh, say, the heat kernel, multiply it by a brown, like, say, by D, uh, DB, um, mm -hmm. by, mm -hmm. and then take a stochastic integral. Uh, and that would, uh, you know, you could construct the free field as a stochastic integral by integrating up contributions uh, uh, given by a, an increment uh, and a Brownian increment multiplied by maybe square root of the heat kernel. Mm -hmm. and, and just to ask about the first term in the in U, uh, the first term in U has this matrix A, the uh, operator de Laplacian, and do you replace that by the um, by uh, the inverse of CS? Uh, the first term in... I mean, the um, you have the quadratic, right? You you explain to us what you, how you renormalize. Yes, yes. so this, this measure yeah. here, quadratic. so this measure here, this ECS is what you get by taking this uh, first term here and replacing A by uh, CS inverse. All right, that's what they asked. All right, yeah. perfect. And if you take uh, S to be infinity, then it's A inverse inverse, so you get A, right? Perfect, thanks. Okay, so this was the densest slide, um, uh, but um, also the most important one maybe, but um, so I've told you that if you start with a convex potential, uh, remain convex, um, uh, given away how, how to prove it, uh, you can, it's basically a Braskam-Lieb inequality, maybe, maybe something before, but any, certainly you can extract, get it from that paper. But uh, an interesting aspect I want to maybe emphasize is it's also a consequence of the maximum principle associated to this Hamlet-Jacobi equation. But um, in any case, um, so here's uh, um, uh, first result, which is, uh, this theorem with um, Thierry Bodino. We, um, it's basically a, re a version of the Bakri-Emerald criterion. Um, we again assume A is, is bigger than lambda times the identity. And remember this lambda is maybe coming from boundary condition or something like that. But now instead of assuming that V naught is con convex, uh, we assume that Vs for every S satisfies a quadratic bound, uh, form bound uh, that it's bounded uh, from below by some uh, mu dot S times the identity. Um, as a quadratic form. And um, so these mu dots, and this is the essential point, they are allowed to be negative. They don't have to be positive. And then you can get a bound on the log Sobolev inequality by just evaluating uh, this integral. So um, this integral, you have e to the minus lambda s minus two mu s, and mu s is the integral from zero to s of uh, mu dot. Um, let me just unpack what this means. If you're on the convex case, these mu's are not negative. So if you, if you evaluate this integral, you get the bakri emery bound. Um, so gamma is at least lambda. But these mu dots don't have to be uh, positive. Um, and uh, in fact, they can be very uh, negative, if you like. As long as this integral makes sense, you get a bound on the log Sobolev constant. Um, And, um, and uh, so I, I'll show you an example where 
apply it to a measure which is rather non-convex, which is this uh, sine Gordon model in the continuum. But we, we can uh, see this integral is, is finite. Um, uh, let me comment just briefly, since uh, I guess I don't have all that much time left, but let me just comment that the proof of this theorem is, is very similar to the bakri amory theorem, not completely surprisingly. But there is one essential difference, which is that this comment may only make sense uh, for, for those who've uh, seen the proof of the bakri amory theorem, which if you remember, uh, proceeds by, you know, uh, interpolating using the original semi-group we're interested in, the large barrel glauber semi-group. We proceed in a, in a similar way, but we use a different semi-group. We don't use the semi-group for which we're proving the Luxobolev constant. We're using uh, this renormalization semi-group, which is related uh, by, uh, which is uh, defined as follows. We, uh, so it's a different semi-group, it's time dependent. Um, and it, it basically corresponds to, uh, I mean, you can think about it in different ways, but uh, the easiest way is that sort of, a, um, it's a variation of the, uh, of what I explained, uh, how this renormalized measure is defined, except that here we're just looking at what happens from one scale S to another scale T. How sort of it's, um, I'll come back to this in a second, but uh, this is just the definition. Um, um, well, another way to see it, it's a linearization of this uh, Polchinski equation here, this nonlinear equation. If you linearize it, you get the semi-group, uh, this semi-group, and it has an infinitesimal generator, which is like this. So it looks, it's a perfectly nice Markov semi-group. Uh, it's time dependent and its symbol varies in, with time and time for us is scale, right? So, um, but you can basically up to a few uh, small but points, you can basically run the bakri emery argument with this, uh, um, with this semi-group and, and this is what you obtain. Um, and we see that in the convex case, you get, you recover the original one, but by, but this semi-group has, a, has much better, um, uh, it, um, it captures the notion of scale much uh, better somehow than the Glauber dynamics. And um, this way we get something that's more effective. So Roland, um, what, yes. what, you're, what you're describing now is like a completely general machinery, right? As long as you can like decompose your Gaussian into different scales, it doesn't even matter what it actually means. It has nothing to do with the grid on ZD as long exactly, as you yeah. can, right? Yeah, and yeah it, it has nothing to do that, with like, it. Like what's written here has really, like this is completely general, right? Exactly, yeah, it's completely and, general. It doesn't, and, uh, and, I mean, the motivation for us was to study these models on, on the lattice, but um, so for example, if you take a double well and just on a single point, uh, you can check that this is applicable. Uh, of course, in that case, you can verify the Luxobolev inequality by, you know, combining uh, the Holy Struck and the bakri emery and stuff like that. But, uh, but this, this would be applicable uh, there. And, and one more question, I guess, when you say bakri emery, I mean, this, this theorem is actually due to Brascamp and Lieb, right? You're just using the proof due to bakri and emery. Well, the Luxobolev one, I thought was due to Bakri and Emery, right? Uh, for the ah, spectral yeah. gap. Okay, may, uh, maybe Braska and Lib. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. That's okay. a spectral gap, I think. Yeah. But, yeah, okay, but, got okay, it. Okay, but uh, yeah, I mean, okay, yeah. Okay. So I, I think since I only have five minutes left, I need to speed up quite a bit at this point. Um, but I wanted to, not to rush this point because uh, Okay, so anyway, let me mention that. Okay, I've already mentioned this, so I'll go through this quickly. There's this uh, this very nice uh, semi-group which we can use and basically run the bakri emery argument. Um, um, the, it also plays a role. Uh, there are some differences to the usual argument in the sense that when we run it, the measure, which in the bakri emery argument is invariant, here it changes at the same time, but there's this nice relation that if we want to understand the original measure, nu naught, we can get it by taking the renormalized measure and then 
and first running this renormalization semi-group. This, this gives a way to decompose this measure. And um, okay, so Michael will explain that this is also, can also be used to get a coupling and so on. But uh, be before I finish, I need to uh, at least uh, say that um, uh, what, what our motivation was or what the main example where we can uh, get an interesting result with this is, um, which is this uh, sine Gordon model. Um, it's, um, uh, has, it's given by this uh, somewhat, uh, uh, well, this is the density. It's, it's basically what I explained on the second slide. So we have a Laplacian and we have a periodic potential and we have the continuum scaling. I want to emphasize this is really rather non-convex. You have an epsilon to the minus beta over four pi in front of the cosine, and epsilon is going to zero. Uh, and um, so if you look at this uh, dynamics, it's, it's given by this equation. And if you take epsilon to zero, it's one of these SPDEs constructed by um, Hira, Shen, and um, Chandra. Um, um, what we get is the log Sobolev constant uh, in the sense that uh, there are some technical assumptions which I don't have time to explain adequately, but uh, this model has some, uh, there's an interesting parameter beta here, which has to be less than six pi, but then for all other finite parameters, uh, we, we see the log Sobolev constant holds and the main point is it's uniform in epsilon. And okay, under certain conditions also uniform in L, but let me not go into this. And um, um, so, of course, uh, in the last two minutes, I, let me say, I mean, so of course we will want to use this, uh, this theorem I explained here. Uh, so for that, we need to control this Hessian of this renormalized potential, which I recall satisfies this equation. So we need to uh, get effective estimates on that, that equation. And in this equation, the initial potential V0 is, uh, well, it's the sum of these cosines, right? It's a periodic function in phi. Um, and uh, as such, it may not be too uh, unreasonable to try to use a Fourier uh, expansion in phi. Uh, it's a rather high dimensional Fourier series because remember phi is an R to the lambda and lambda is a huge set, uh, but still it's periodic. And indeed you can uh, try to do that. You can seek a solution VT written as a Fourier series. Um, I won't have time to explain this, but this is a Fourier series. Uh, you may think of this as a Fourier series if you want, but it's not really the conventional way to write a Fourier series. It's, it's really one that uh, that's, works well in high dimensions. And this is not a coincidence. I mean, this is a beautiful observation due to Bridges and Kennedy. Um, I mean, this uh, Fourier representation, uh, basically the Fourier coefficients are partition functions of a Yukawa gas, something like that. Uh, so I'm not going to explain this, but for those who uh, may have seen this before um, uh, or re something related, maybe this will ring a bell. But let, otherwise, let me just say that there is a very nice way to uh, express a Fourier series for this, this model. Um, and um, with, um, uh, in which these, uh, uh, okay, so in which the configurations can be thought of, of uh, collections of charges. Um, and uh, well, then one can uh, solve the Kuczynski equation by writing the integral equation form and iterating those integral equations. And it turns out that one can get effective estimates using this, uh, this procedure that, that are sufficient to get the log Sobolev constant. Um, since my time is up, I will end here. Uh, I would just, uh, as a, a teaser for, the, for Michael's uh, talk, uh, which is coming next, uh, let me mention that you can also use uh, this kind of procedure to get a decomposition of the field itself uh, uh, by writing it as a stochastic integral, which is um, um, which uh, reveals uh, the um, um, contributions of different scales uh, in a, as a stochastic integral way. And uh, using this, for example, obtain a coupling between uh, the non-Gaussian field and the Gaussian field uh, with uh, 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 very nice uh, properties. Uh, um, okay, I will not explain this now, uh, but uh, if there is a few minutes for questions, I, I might be able to say something then if there is interest. So, okay, let me finish here.
אוקיי, אני קורא Is uh, six pi the, uh, the sharp number for this? Uh, no, that's a very good question. Eight pi is the, is the, would be the optimal, um, would be the optimal threshold. So, so in some sense, this uh, sine Gordon measure is uh, from the construction point of view is relatively mild up to four pi because it corresponds to what uh, people call a wick renormalization. Um, so it's absolutely continuous with respect to the free field up to four pi uh, in finite volume. Um, beyond four pi, it's not absolutely continuous with respect to the free field anymore, it's singular. Um, um, and uh, there is in fact a sequence of thresholds where sort of additional renormalization contributions become relevant and six pi is the first such threshold. And then they accumulate at a pi. But okay, this is a um, uh, maybe. Um, I if you if you like, I can explain it afterwards, maybe. But it's uh, maybe a little bit uh, too long of a story to explain in this. That's <laughs> okay. Here. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> here. Okay. Any other question? So, yeah, I have. Uh, so, in this calculation of this uh, mu dot that you just explained. Uh, can you point us to where exactly you, you use the fact that the potential is of this particular form cosine blah blah where you know if I change cosine by some other oscillatory function or whatever this would uh, fail? No, you can have something more that general than cosine. It's, you, you could have um, um, you could have some uh, cosine with a different with a second period. That it's twice the first period or something like that. That would be possible. Um, but so where are you using? I mean, if I, you know, just give you a completely different, you know, function. Where, where is the fact that what property of cosine are you using here? This is what uh, I. I mean, here I'm using that this cosine can be written in this uh, this nice Fourier series. I mean, basically that once you have a periodic function, it remains periodic under this. Uh, uh, Hamilton-Jacobi equation. Uh, okay, so, I get it. So, okay, so you okay. Can, uh, I missed you this can, part. You can seek a periodic solution. And so as a periodic so solution, it's a good idea to write it as a Fourier series. I mean, periodic in, in the field variable, right? And so, uh, and that is very useful here. Um, I mean, I don't, ex so for example, I expect um, this condition to be uh, true for, 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 um, various other potentials, but it's, it's not uh, so easy to, to check, right? It's, uh, um, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, I get it now. I just missed the, I, one of the main points of that slide. Yeah, now this, this slide was, was way too fast. I, I, I ran out of time, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Thanks. OK, maybe you should conclude here and thank Roland again. Um, and we should start the next. Uh, talk in a couple of minutes. OK, well, thank you. I will uh, um, then uh, lock off my iPad, right? <laughs>